So yes, good morning, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm James Goff, Girls Clag, as Beck met, mentioned. Uh, my home institution is College of the Canyons. We are a California community college. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, that context in, in, in a minute or two. And as you see here, I'm going to share information about the program entitled Open for Anti-Racism, which uh, proposes to leverage open and open education to support anti-racist classrooms. So that's really a, a question I have for all of you throughout this throughout this session. Uh, and uh, we'll have time time at the end to talk about it. Uh, and, and that is, how could this apply to your context? You know, we have people here from from all over the place. And uh, oftentimes, uh, racism and anti-racism are portrayed, at least, as uh, per peculiarly American issues or problems. Um, so I'll be really interested to, to hear uh, what you think about the applicability of this, uh, the concept uh, to your own context. So, uh, Beck, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, here's just a little overview of what I'll, what I'll talk through today. Uh, give you a program, an overview of the program. Uh, pause for a minute to uh, define what we mean by anti-racist pedagogy. Uh, we'll share, so I'll share some examples of how this program ties open education to anti-racism in action in classrooms. Um, I know we've got researchers here, so I'll uh, spend a few minutes as well talking about the research agenda around the program. And then at the very end, I have a request for you, as Beck mentioned, um, together with my colleague, Joy Shoemate, we have the distinct honor of uh, delivering a keynote at the Open Ed Conference in Providence this October. So uh, we have a request to you to contribute to that keynote. So that'll be towards the end. Uh, with that, the next slide, please, Beck. So uh, just a plug for my partners on this project, uh, the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, or CCCOER. Uh, CCC OER co-leads uh, the Open for Anti-Racism program together with College of the Canyons. And I should say that uh, the program is very generously supported by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. They are just exceptional partners to many of us in the open education community, and they are uh, exceptional partners, certainly, on the OFAR program. So next slide, please. Thank you, Beck. Um, so this this slide uh, just gives a shout out to those who make things happen in this program. Uh, you don't need to know, remember the names of all these people. You'll you'll meet some of them uh, probably through the course of your work or their work in, in in open education. But the point here is that we have quite a team making the Open for Anti Racism program happen. Uh, on the left hand side, you'll see uh, the program leaders. Uh, uh, some of you might re might know Una Daly, who is the co-founder of the OFAR program with myself. She has since moved on to her retirement or rewirement, as she calls it. So we have a new uh, co-director of the OFAR program, Laura Dunn, who's just fantastic, doing great work uh, on this program, and, uh, and a whole host of, of folks who are uh, making the program happen. And again, the point is just that it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of people to to create a new program and, and make it make it successful. Uh, so next slide, please. So what, what I hope that you'll walk away with um, uh, is first of all, being able to define anti-racist pedagogy or understand the way that we define anti-racist pedagogy for the purpose of this program. Uh, describe how open education can support anti-racist pedagogy and pre well, pre predominantly we work in, in the online spaces, but certainly it works in the physical classrooms as well, uh, and then assess how well the OFAR program could be applied in your context. I'm really curious about that. Uh, next slide, please. So a couple of words about our context. So as I mentioned, my home institution is College of the Canyons. It is a California community college. Um, in California, we have 116 uh, public community colleges. We uh, provide two-year degrees uh, to our students and a host of certificates uh, in career technical education, but also our students transfer uh, to, uh, to the universities in our state. We serve over 2 million students in California. Um, you see the race, race and ethnic breakdown of our student body, uh, gender distribution you see as well here on the screen. Uh, notably, we have uh, a third of our students are first-generation college students, uh, first-generation in their families, to attend college, which we're really proud of, and uh, uh, 
surprisingly, only 10% of our students identify as English language learners. That took me a little bit by surprise, uh, considering the, uh, uh, the, the large uh, rates of immigration we have in California. Uh, but uh, uh, we are all uh, very proudly open access institutions. We succeed by taking the top 100% of applicants to our institutions. Um, and uh, so this is the context in which the OFAR program works uh, until this point. Uh, we have been fortunate that uh, a number of colleagues from around the United States have adopted and adapted the OFAR program. I saw, I think I saw Stacy Katz come in here. Maybe Stacy can say a few words later on about uh, how she uh, and, and her, her colleagues have adapted the OFAR program in New York. Uh, but, but for the time being, our main, main uh, context of doing the work is uh, the California Community Colleges. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the the origins of the program again uh, come come from uh, the spring and summer of 2020 uh, in the United States. Um, in the United States, uh, you might remember the the horrendous murder of George Floyd at the hands of police and many other uh, African Americans uh, murdered at the hands of police in the United States uh, uh, over many many too many years. Um, at that time, uh, my dear colleague Una Daly, as I mentioned, uh, she and I sort of took stock of what we were doing in, in open education. You know, we'd been deeply involved in open education for over a decade. And uh, it dawned on us very late, I must say, it dawned on us just how uh, incredibly white the field of open education is uh, in the United States, at least, and, and in Western Europe. Um, so we wanted to uh, do something about that. And we also were a little mm, frustrated, let's say, at seeing institution after institution, university after university, college after college, uh, issue statements to the public and place place uh, statements on their website saying, uh, we decry racism and we condemn what's going on and we're going to make ourselves anti-racist institutions. And this this phrase of anti-racism was, was in the air at that time. Uh, and so many institutions and organizations committed to being anti-racist. And, and then after a while, you know, nothing happened. <laughs> I don't know if that was the situation in, in your in your worlds, but certainly was the situation in my world that lots of statements were were made, but uh, no action was taken. So uh, Una and I realized uh, that uh, uh, our our colleagues in the classroom wanted indeed to make their teaching anti-racist, but they needed training, they needed support, they needed a safe space and and a network uh, that would help them do that. Um, and Una and I just thought, gee whiz. Um, you know that what what we know open ed education we think that open education can provide helpful tools to faculty or academics who want to who do want to make their teaching anti racist so the 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 proposition of the program is that people do want to make uh, their teaching anti racist and open education and open pedagogy OER uh, all of that as a bundle can help folks to transform their teaching in a way to make it anti-racist. So next slide, please. And I'll finally, finally start describing what the program actually is. Uh, that's quite a, quite a preface there. Sorry about that. Um, so the program goals and activities. Um, so overall, we um, accept applications from teams of participants from colleges around, around California. Uh, we currently work with eight teams uh, or teams of, of four to six from eight colleges in California. So every year we're working with 40 to 45 uh, faculty from California community colleges, eight different colleges. Um, the, the goal is to support them to learn about OER, learn about open pedagogy, and learn about anti-racist teaching uh, and use the tools of OER and open pedagogy to make their teaching uh, anti-racist. I will say that uh, quite interestingly, we've heard from our participants this past year uh, we're in, we're just we just concluded our fourth year, just starting our fifth year. Uh, so feedback from participants in our fourth year uh, uh, was that we that they know quite a bit more about OER than we give them credit for in our training. So uh, we should dial back on the uh, introductory material around OER. And the reason cited is this massive investment that that Beck referenced at the beginning, uh, this massive investment in zero textbook cost programs in the California Community Colleges, a $115 million investment uh, for California Community Colleges to build Z degrees. Um, there's such an influx of money and professional development that uh, a lot of folks actually are learning about OER uh, through other ways than our program, which is great. Uh, so 
the structure of the program that is that in the fall term, our participants participate in, an, in a facilitated online course. Uh, they learn about OER and open pedagogy, but mainly they're learning about anti-racism and anti-racist pedagogy. Uh, then at towards the end of that course, they craft uh, an action plan to make a real concrete change in their courses in the spring semester. So in the fall, they're learning. In the spring, they're implementing. Um, throughout the year, they benefit from peer connections, monthly webinars, coaching. We we uh, uh, assign a coach, an experienced, uh, experienced uh, participant in our program, past participant in our program, or somebody who's done a lot of work in anti-racism. We assign them to coach each team, be a, be a, a supporter for each team. Uh, and we ensure that they receive some administrative support at their institutions as well. And then throughout the year, we're documenting the impact through surveys, interviews, uh, historical student outcomes data, and so on. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, yeah, so that's that's the overview of the program. Um, we're serving yeah between 40 and 45 participants each year. Uh, they're learning in the fall, implementing in the spring. We're documenting the uh the uh efforts throughout next slide please um so when we say anti open for anti-racism what are we talking about when we talk about anti-racism uh this is our working definition it's evolved a little bit over time i, I expect it will evolve a little bit uh, more during the coming year um, um so the definition that we use is first of all being race conscious so really acknowledging your identity acknowledging your position um recognizing that implicit bias exists and talking about race. I don't know about your context, but a lot of times Americans, especially white Americans, are very, very uh, uh, cautious in talking about race or they don't know how to talk about race. They don't have the language. Um, uh, we also encourage people to think systemically and structurally um, to expose systemic racism, structural racism, particularly in our disciplines and in our institutions. Uh, you know, we've unfortunately heard too many times people say, well, I'm not racist because of this, that, or the other thing. But then if we examine the institutions that we serve, uh, we might take a different view of things. Um, we also ask, very importantly, folks to examine the history of their discipline, uh, ask how knowledge is defined. This is really, you know, an epistemological question. Uh, who gets to have a voice in the, in the discipline? Where does knowledge come from? Um, and then obviously include voices and perspectives from many people and groups, uh, and very importantly, and really where we get the overlap with open pedagogy is to invite students to contribute their own perspectives and their own experiences to the instructional materials. And that's, that's an easy leap for all of us here to make uh, when we're working with students to create OERs or uh, engaging in open pedagogy and renewable assignments in the classroom and so on and so forth. Um, I will say that uh, I, I do expect our, our definition to evolve during this year uh, because we're going to engage in, a, in a, a program review. We're going to engage an outside an outside consultant to come in uh, and uh, just ensure uh, that we're we're utilizing the latest literature that uh, the, the language we use is is current. Our that our that our approach is is up to date. So uh, yeah, maybe a year from now this will look a bit different, but. Uh, Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, we also conduct webinars, provide webinars throughout the year. You know, I'm deeply knowledgeable about open education, but not about anti-racism. Uh, so, and, and I think the program team uh, would, would say the same, that we come at this from a perspective of, of open education, not anti-racism. So we've had to uh, involve lots of outside experts and we're really, we've, you know, continue to learn. We're very blessed to have lots of experts uh, uh, willing to help us out uh, in the program. So here on the screen, you just see a couple of examples of webinars that we provided during this past year. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you see a, a webinar entitled Black and African-American Community College Transfer Success, uh, uh, in, in which researchers uh, for the state have, have, uh, have studied the uh, patterns of at black and African American students transferring from community colleges to universities and uh, identifying systemic uh, barriers and 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 uh, enablers for uh, black and African American students to successfully transfer. So we dug deep into the uh, research with those researchers. Then on the right hand side of the screen, you see 
uh, a webinar entitled Black Feminist Pedagogy and Open Education, which was delivered by somebody hopefully uh, we all know here, uh, Dr. Jasmine Roberts Cruz uh, with uh, the Ohio State University. She gave a fantastic, fantastic talk for us. Uh, hopefully many of you have been, had the opportunity to, to hear her talk about the uh, roots of open education. Uh, place and she places them in Black feminist pedagogy. So really worthwhile checking out her work. It's really, uh, really, it was eye-opening for me to say the least. So that was great. Uh, so we do a host of webinars like that throughout the year. Uh, next slide, please. And you'll be able to uh, scan this very, I'm uh, sorry, very fuzzy QR code. Uh, if we hover on this for a second, we'll go to that, go to that link up there in the top left-hand corner. Uh, you'll be able to, um, to check out our webinars from the past year. But let me, while we're doing this, let me just drop into the chat the uh, website for the program so that you can go check out the program yourself. You'll find uh, links to the webinar, all the webinars on that website. Uh, so next slide, please, Beck. Um, so what is what is the the end product look like if our participants are learning in the fall, they're taking this online course, they're learning about anti-racist pedagogy, the connections with OER and open, open education, they're crafting a, uh, uh, an, an action plan. Oh, oh, thank you, Stacy, for putting that link there to uh, to to Jasmine's article. Yeah, it's really, really good stuff. Um, um, so they're implementing an action plan in their class to change something based on what they've learned. Well, what what are they doing? What are they actually doing? Well, a um, um, couple of real low 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 lying low low um, low hanging uh, examples, I think, are that uh, if you're teaching a history course, you might uh, use uh, uh, an open textbook that doesn't really cover all the topics uh, that you might want to cover, you could work together with your students to revise that open textbook and now include a module on Juneteenth or a module on, on different aspects of Black and African American history that were not included in the textbook to begin with. Or if you're teaching a biology class, an anatomy, anatomy and physiology class, in which all the images of the human body are white uh, images or images of white skin, you could work together with your students to ask them to revise uh, that textbook by taking images of bodies that reflect the reality of their community. Um, on the right hand side of the screen, you see some screenshots from uh, a project this past year, a colleague, uh, a, his, a history professor uh, uh, was in the process of finishing up a, a, an OER textbook on women's history in the United States. Uh, when she entered the OFAR program, she threw out a bunch of chapters, changed a lot of things and invited her students to help her finish up uh, many of the chapters. So uh, that's those are a couple of examples of of, uh, of the products that uh, our participants produce. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we'll see another another example. Um, uh, this is a, always a favorite of mine. Uh, Dr. Oliver Rosales from uh, Bakersfield Community College uh, works with works in an environment in which uh, most of his most of the students are um, migrant laborers, uh, mostly from uh, Central and Southern America, Central and South America working in the Central Valley of California, which is a very agricultural region. Um, and these are uh, people who don't always see their histories reflected in the official history books, or let alone in the um, uh, memorials or, or museums of communities. So uh, Oliver worked with his students to have them document their family's history, histories of how they came to their to their uh, to their location in the Central Valley of California, and he created a virtual archive uh, with his students so that they could see themselves reflected, see their communities reflected, see their stories reflected uh, in a way that's ongoing, and and they can students contribute that to that every year. New students contribute to that uh, that living archive. So those are those are a couple of examples of what our what our uh, participants have produced um, with uh, classes in science, technology, engineering, and math. We've had plenty of Plenty of uh, participants in those from those disciplines over the years. Although many of the many of the participants begin by saying, you know, numbers can't be racist, right? Uh, uh, but by the time they work through work through uh, much of much of our material, they do understand that uh, numbers can can reflect silences, numbers can reflect elisions and 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 omissions. Uh, so we've had a lot of colleagues uh, work with their students in uh, mathematics to uh, study. Uh, patterns of of uh, of uh, uh, patterns of uh, let's say uh, uh, how investment is made in in a community 
uh, in one community or in another community. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, science professors work with their students to uh, identify uh, Black and African American or minoritized uh, scientists whose voices have been silenced over the years or whose voices have not been reflected uh, in, in the uh, textbooks that their students are using in class over the years. So uh, quite a few great examples there. You'll find more on our website. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we also ask our participants to, uh, or teams that apply to be in the program, we ask them to provide a letter of support from uh, an administrator at their institution so that we uh, know that the institution recognizes, is aware that they're doing this work. Uh, our, uh, I will share here a quote from a college administrator last year, uh, really shouting out the value of their team participating in this. He writes, uh, he or she writes, we have a group of faculty that are not supportive of diversity, equity, and inclusion or anti-racism initiatives and actively lead lobby to stop them. The more faculty we have with anti-racist skill sets, the more successful we will become in becoming, we will be in becoming an anti-racist college. So uh, we find it really important to uh, ensure that the teams of faculty who are in the program are connected to their institutions. We've asked institutions uh, to identify in their letters of support how they would support their faculty if they were to become subjects of attacks uh, based on their participation in this program. Unfortunately, uh, we've over the years, we've had that, we've heard that experience from participants that they've been attacked by fellow faculty, they've been attacked by verbally attacked, uh, or in, in one case, uh, uh, attacked on social media, uh, really horrible, horrible uh, death threats and, 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 and mobbing, act, uh, mobbing activity on social media because of, of faculty participating in this program. So we started again to ask uh, institutions who are supporting their uh, faculty to participate to identify for us how they will support uh, participants in, in, in such cases so that the burden is not falling uh, solely on the participants. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit about the research here. Again, I know we have researchers in the room, so I want to uh, uh, anticipate uh, potential questions here. Um, what we do is uh, uh, we, we do pre-surveys and post-surveys of participants, asking about how their attitudes and, and, and knowledge have changed over the years. And we'll, I'll share a little bit, some examples of that uh, in the next couple of slides. Uh, we uh, do student surveys uh, in the classes taught by the faculty in the term of implementation. So that's in the spring term. Uh, we do administrator surveys uh, also in the spring term. Uh, we interview a subset of participants. So we have, 40 to 45 participants every year. We interview eight to 10 participants every year. Uh, and then our researchers, and I'll talk about our researchers in a second. It's not, not certainly not me doing the research. Um, I'm way not qualified for that. Um, our researchers um, draw from the participating institutions student outcomes data for three years prior, uh, the term of implementation and one term post. So. Uh, if if I'm if I'm in the program, uh, my institution will provide student learning outcomes from three years before I participate in the program, the spring term in which I'm implementing a change in my in my class, and also one term uh, post. So this this coming fall, my institution would provide student uh, outcomes data as well. Uh, you can see our student um, our our year three research report at that link, which I will drop in the chat here. Um, so you can check that out. That's year three. We just finished year four. Year four is year is going through editing right now, so we don't have it up on our website yet. Uh, it's being formatted and so on. And then the research team for us is uh, the R. We, what they they're called the RP group, the Research and Planning Group for California Community Colleges. Dropped a link uh, in the chat to their website. Um, they are. Uh, uh, a group of uh, institutional researchers who have worked in the California Community Colleges uh, previously. Now they're now they're independent consultants, uh, and they do a lot of work for the colleges here. They know our they know our system. They know our nomenclature and so on and so forth. So uh, they're just fantastic uh, folks to work with. Um, next slide, please. And I'll share some of the some of the uh, feedback that we've gotten in our in our research. So um, faculty practices when we ask faculty. Um, uh, what 
what uh, based on pre pre and post surveys, uh, what what uh, teaching practices uh, impacted your your teaching? Uh, One hundred percent of them said uh, anti-racist and culturally responsive responsive pedagogy uh, uh, improved my teaching. Uh, Eighty-eight and a half percent of our participants said uh, that using open pedagogy improved their teaching, and um, eighty-eight percent uh, in year one uh, said that using OER improved their teaching. We, we've subsequently dropped that question. That's why we we I just note there that that's year one again. As I said, that over the years we've had more uh, more folks tell us that they're more aware of OER generally. Next slide, please. Um, this is this is a result that was really uh, heartwarming to me. Um, in year three, in the pre-survey, we asked participants how confident they feel in discussing uh, race and racism and anti-racism with their students. Uh, and in year three, 28% uh, in the pre-survey, 28% said they felt confident or very confident. And at the end of the program, 88.5% said they felt confident or very confident. Great change there. That was fantastic. Interestingly, in year four, uh, the pre-survey result was 69%, I think. 69% came into the program uh, with feeling some, some level of confidence, which was great. So the after was also, I think, 89%. So definitely a change there, but the gap was, was less. So I think that probably similar to the uh, feedback we've gotten around the increasing knowledge of OER, I think also over the past few years in the California Community Colleges, We've got had a lot of work just generally around what we'd say um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So a lot more people are coming into the program, I think, with with more knowledge, more professional development, uh, et cetera. Um, so uh, interesting, interesting observation there. Next slide, please. We also asked the administrators uh, uh, about uh, the, the way OFAR is connecting to their work uh, or to the institution. 87% uh, of the college administrators said they felt very engaged in the OFAR work, which is fantastic. 100% said they provided support. And we think that's really important, again, so that if there's pushback, our, our participants are not left on their own. But really, we want to make institutional change. We want to somehow help these teams have a larger impact on their institution, uh, because a lot of times the barriers to change uh, rest in the institutions themselves. Um, so we ask throughout the program, we ask our teams to check in with their administrators to once a month, send the administ sponsoring administrator an email or drop by their office, just let them know what's going on. And we've heard from participants that uh, their administrators have uh, arranged for uh, the OFAR teams to be featured at the opening day of the academic term uh, to give a professional development workshop for the entire institution or to be featured at their local board of trustees meetings or uh, other governance meetings. So uh, I, I think this, this, this connectivity is, is definitely helping our OFAR teams get more, get more air, get more visibility at the institutions, which is, which is uh, certainly one of our goals there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with the student, so from the student surveys, 88% um, uh, of students tell us that they have examined the history of their discipline in their courses. And if we think back to the to our definition of anti-racism, 83.5% uh, tell us that uh, they are treated the same as other students in the class, um, and 82% uh, tell us that their thoughts and ideas are valued as much as other students in the class. So we think those are good results. Of course, uh, the researchers out there are saying, well, did you do these surveys before uh, OFAR, before the participation in OFAR, and, and students change every every term, et cetera, et cetera. So no, we haven't done that. But uh, still, I think these are you know, pretty, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with these. I'm pretty happy about these. Uh, but yeah, we don't we don't know what the comparison would be if we if we hadn't had the OFAR intervention here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you can find our uh, course uh, in Canvas Commons. Um, uh, the uh, training course uh, has been, uh, of course, is openly licensed, and it is perfectly uh, uh, available to you to to download um, and and adapt. We'd be we just love it if you would, and we'd love it if you'd let us know if you were doing that. That would be be great to hear from you as well. Um, and then next slide, please. 
Um, so let me pause here, and I am. This is this is where you can. Well, first first of two places where you can get something to meet. First of all, I am very curious uh, whether you think any of this would resonate in your own environment, in your own context. Um, how are you doing oh, anti-racism work or diversity, equity, inclusion work in your own environment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'd love to, to love to hear from all of you.